welcome to part four on our segment related to cubism. In this video, we're going to be looking at some artists and responses to the movement of cubism that Picasso and Brock um, helped to develop. So the artist's work that we're looking at right now is, um, his name is um, Constantine Brancusi, and he is often regarded as the most important sculptor of the 20th century. His visionary sculptures often exemplify ideal and archetypal representations of their subject matter, um, bearing iconic titles such as fish, princess X, and bird in space. His sculptures are deceptively simple with this sort of reduce, where he seems like he's sort of reducing forms um, to, you know, very simple shapes. Um, but his aim is to reveal um, hidden truths. Unlike the towering figures of Augustus Rodin, from whom Brancusi, Brancusi briefly assisted early in his, his career, Brancusi worked directly with his materials, pioneering the te technique of direct car carving rather than working with um, intermediaries such as plaster or clay models. And so these are two of his sculptures right here, um, Sleeping Muse One, and then Bird in Space. This is a very popular one. You might have seen it before. So some key ideas that we're going to think about when looking at Brancusi's work. Um, one thing is explaining that the artist should know how to dig out um, the beginning that is within the matter. And that's a quote from Brancusi. So he sought to create sculptures that conveyed the true essence of his subjects. Um, sometimes his sculptures were animals, peoples, objects, um, and really concentrating on highly simplified forms free of ornamentation. While many regarded his art as abstract, the artist disagreed. He insisted on the representational nature of his works, asserting that they were disclosed as fundamental, often concealed reality. Brancusi's work was largely fueled by myths, folklore, and primitive cultures. These traditional old world sources of inspiration formed a unique contrast to the often sleek appearance of his works, resulting in a distinctive blend of modernity and um, timelessness. The materials Brancusi used, primarily marble, stone, bronze, wood, and metal, guided the specific forms he produced. He paid close attention to his mediums, meticulously polishing the pieces for days to achieve a gleam that suggested infinite continui, con, continuity into the surrounding space, um, quote, as though they proceed out from the mass into some perfect and complete existence. So here you can definitely see um, how he's really um, polished um, this, this bird in space sculpture, which is rather phallic looking. Um, Portraits, heads, and busts were frequent subjects for Brancusi, and he received several commissions for such work. Um, he did receive a commission for Sleeping Muse One, which we see right here, um, modeled on the Baroness Rene Arana Fracon. So this was actually um, supposed to represent an individual. Brancusi developed a distinctive form of the portrait bust, represent representing only its sitter's disembodied head. This work was Brancusi's first handling of the sleeping head, a thematic cycle that occupied the artist for roughly 20 years. Um, the smoothness of this piece achieved by the artist's practice of polishing the surface of his sculptures until they achieved a high gleam, again, really contrast with the carved definition of the sitter's facial features. So, you know, things to reference, you know, maybe looking back at um, Roman Republican um, sculpture, and, you know, that could be something that we might compare and contrast. But definitely, um, it's important to, 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 you know, that we, that we do understand Brancusi's um, sentiment that, you know, for him, his work was representational and not so abstract as it, it might appear. So on the right, we'll talk a little bit about Bird in Space from 1928. Um, bird imagery constituted a major part of Brancusi's work for much of his career, beginning with his 1910 um, Maestra sculptures, and I'll show you an example of that based on the magical bird um, from, from Romanian folklore. Um, he proceeded to works such as Magic Bird and Golden Bird. 
So let me bring up those examples. So here is the image um, from um, the series Maestra Sculptures. And again, I think you can see definitely that um, even though it's more simplified, that it, it does um, represent a bird. And here is, um, it, this is from the same series, the Maestra Sculptures. This is Golden Bird. Um, this is the, the one I showed you was Magic Bird. And so you, again, you see the use of this um, gold metal and the sleekness of it and the polished um, gleam it has. And, and this is very characteristic, especially in his later metal pieces. But again, he also really, you know, highly polished um, his stone work as well. And he often would do um, the same subject in different mediums. Um, so he might do, um, let me see if I can find an example, but he would do, um, you know, the same um, form um, in marble. So here's an example of the bird and space sculpture done in, in marble, um, just to give you a comparison. So the sculpture Bird in Space is probably uh, one of his most famous sculptures um, in, in terms of the different variations that um, he created using um, the bird as a form, um, and probably one of his best known treatments of this bird theme. Um, in these intensely polished works, um, Brancusi dispensed with the bird's physical attributes, focusing instead on capturing the essence of flight um, through these elongated, slightly tapering figures that suggested the bird's swift upward movement. So again, instead of trying to represent the bird's physical features, um, he's trying to capture the essence of a bird and soaring and flight and, and those things um, that we think about or associate um, with this idea of birds. So this is a sculpture um, by Brancusi, who was a Romanian sculptor, and uh, this is referred to as the kiss. Um, we've seen the subject matter before. Hopefully you remember Gustav Klimt and his version of the kiss. So these are two images or two works of art that you might be able to compare and contrast. Um, so um, this is an early example of his proto-cubist style. So we do see this cubist style not just in painting, but um, emerging in the medium of sculpture as well. Um, and so this proto-cubist style um, sort of fit in with his non, um, I, you know, this idea of non-literal representation. So this is a plaster that was exhibited um, at the 1913 Armory Show and published in the Chicago Tr Tribune. Um, and this early plaster sculpture is one of six casts that Brancusi made of the 19, made of the 1907-08 The Kiss. I'll show you the original in a second. The original stone carving um, is located in um, the Art Museum in Romania. So Brancusi created many versions of The Kiss. Um, in each one, he tried to further simplify geometric forms and sparse objects in each version and really sort of tending to move each time further toward abstraction. His abstract style emphasized simple geometric lines that balanced forms inherent in his materials with symbolic illusions of representational art. So while sort of the physical representation, representation was more cubist and abstract, he still thought of his symbolic interpretation and references as being representational. All right, so here's another version of the kiss. I'm sorry, I thought I had the original, but I think this is a, another version that he did in stone. So Constantine Brancusi's series of works, you know, titled The Kiss, constitutes one of the most celebrated depictions of love in the history of art. This is um, version, I think this is the fourth version, and perhaps probably the most sophisticated of the several sculptures Brancusi created around this theme. Um, he is utilizing a limestone block. The artist employed the method of direct carving to produce um, an incised, um, the incised contours that um, delineate the male and female forms. The juxtaposition of smooth and rough surfaces paired with dramatic simplifications of the human figure, which are shown from the waist up, may suggest Brancusi's awareness of primitive African sculpture and perhaps also of the cubist works of his contemporaries. 
The artist carved this sculpture specifically for John Quinn, the New York lawyer, an art collector who had been interested in obtaining an earlier version of the kiss that was done in 1907-08. Um, this particular version was no longer in the sculpture's possession. When Quinn later inquired about the proper way to display his new acquisition, Brancusi responded that the work should be placed just as it is on something separate for any kind of arrangement for any kind of arrangement will have to look will have the look of an amputation. So let me see if I can find the original. Hold on. So here is um, the original. Um, they all start to look alike, but this is the original stone. And you know you might want to compare it in contrast to um, the 1916 version that the AP College Board um, has represented. But definitely this one is much curvier. And I think, you know, there's definitely, it definitely looks a little bit more representational, especially with the depiction of the arms, where um, the, let me see if I can bring that up. Um, this version is definitely more blocky, and, you know, there's definitely more, it's it's not as, um, the arms aren't as um, delineated, they're, you know, it's more simplified. Um, so, and that was the idea that with each version, he tried to sort of simplify these, the, this idea. And I think, you know, this process of simplifying these forms was how he, he really thought that he was getting to this idea of the essence of the subject that he was depicting. All right, so we're going to turn to another artist who um, was responding to Cubism as well. This is a painter, um, Modrian. You've probably seen his work. And um, Pierre Modrian was born um, in March of um, 1872, and he's from the Netherlands. Um, he did study art um, in Amsterdam from 1892 to 1897. And until 1908, when he began to take annual trips to um, to um, Dumburg in Zeeland, um, Modrian's work was pretty naturalistic, incorporating um, a success of influences of, you know, academic landscape, still life painting, Dutch impressionism, symbolism. So he kind of went through this different um, experimentation. So here's an example of some of his early work. So here I think he was pretty influenced by um, you know, the symbolist movement, maybe even the fav, the fauvist, you know, especially with these um, bright, um, vivid colors. Here's another um, example, too. Here he's doing a landscape, and you really do start to see him sort of playing around with the mark making and quality, the line quality of the trees. And here's another image where we do start to see him um, becoming more um, geometric and and, you know, simplifying his subject. Um, this is during um, his period with the Gestile um, group of artists um, that he was um, working with. So I wanted you to see those earlier examples to see, you know, how he, he got to this, which is really what he's known for. And so he didn't really start um, experimenting um, with uh, the Cubist mode of art until 1911, and he did this after seeing the original Cubist works of George Brock and Pablo Picasso. Um, at an exhibition in Amsterdam in 1911. So Modrian decided to move to Paris, um, and he stayed there from 1912 to 1914, and he began to develop this independent um, abstract um, style um, that he became very well known for. So here's a good um, image, um, a series of images to show you sort of his development and the sort of... Um, progress he made towards this abstract style. So here you have this image of a tree done in 1908, and then some, you know, I showed you this work, and, and you can really see how, um, sort of like Brancusi, I think this idea of the tree, where it physically looks like a tree, and then here with, with these sort of the simplification um, in representing the tree, it, you know, it's more about the essence of the tree, and, and even here in this, this later one, which is very abstract. So Modrian was visiting the, ne the Netherlands when World War I broke out and prevented him from returning to Paris. 
during the war years in holland he further reduced his colors and geometric shapes and formulated his non-objective what um, is termed neoplastic style of painting um, in 1917 modrian began um, one of became one of the founders of this group known as G gestile um, d-e-s-t-i jl and i know i'm probably mispronouncing it um, this group was um, which included um, many different artists um, extended its principles of abstraction and simplification beyond painting and sculpture um, to other mediums such as architecture graphic design and industrial design Medrian's essay um, on abstract art was published in the periodical um, de gestile in july 1919 um, and then he eventually did return to Paris and began exhibiting with the um, J. Justile in 1923. This movement was based off this idea of this style of neoplastic ideology of art, which Modrian was extremely influential in developing and exploration um, of this philosophy. Neoplasticism um, pursued the goal to create new pictorial rhythms, through a novel plastic representation of space. Modrian believed that the success of a neo-plastic um, painting depended on the inspired intuition of the maker. Um, this style can be thought of as somewhat a transitional style out of cubism into a full-fledged exploration and engagement of um, De Gestile. <laughs> De Gestile was not a group of similar, was a group was not a group of similar artists or stylistic techniques, um, nor was it a school devoted to art or design, but rather um, the group was a collective project or enterprise between 1917 to 1928. Um, this idea of a collective project can be simply thought of as an artist, as artists coming together and exploring new ideas in art, literature, architecture, and many other facets while conversing between each other over their work and their colleagues. Um, even though this was not an established group, the artists associated with this period knew each other's work and produced pieces that were stylistically and contextually reminiscent of each other throughout this movement. The basic principles of the De Gestile movement promoted um, was this idea of stripping down of the traditional forms into simple, basic geometric um, components or elements. The composition from these um, separate elements or formal configurations, which were perceived as holes, W-H-O-L-E-S, um, were, while remaining clearly constructed from individual and independent elements, um, studied and sometimes extreme asymmetry of composition or design. Um, an ex, um, exclusive use of intersectional horizontal and vertical lines along with um, pigment um, primary colors, so the use of just very simple colors, red, blue, yellow, plus neutral colors or tones. The artists involved with this movement were profoundly engrossed with novel and progressive ideas about the relationship between the production and conception of art and design, and the impact or influence of modern society and social life. The subject matter of these paintings were not the traditional figures, landscapes, and scenes as have been previously represented by other painters and artists. Instead, um, the De Gestile movement focused on subject matter that was concerned with geometry and form. So here is one of Modrian's um, later work. This He started doing this type of work after the De Gestile group or when that started to wind down. This is known as composition with yellow, red, and blue. Um, remember we looked at an earlier artist, Kandinsky, who also um, titled his works using terms like composition or improvisation. So that might be a good um, compare and contrast to or something to go back and review. We're going to be focusing on this painting. Um, this is, and I, I forgot to put this title, I'll make sure I do that when I post your lecture notes. This is composition with red, blue, and yellow, done in um, 1930. Um, and this is a canvas. It's um, about a 46 by 46 um, centimeter canvas, so it is a true square. This oil painting consists of geometric figures, in particular variations of squares and rectangles. 
Combinations of thick and thin planar lines are used to form the boundaries between the color blocks in the painting. These planar lines can be described as flat and simplistic. They are not detailed and show little brush work. The planes that are created by these lines are a variety of sizes and colors. In this painting, the lines do not create distinctive borders, but instead the rectangle planes fully extend onto the edges of the canvas. Modrian used red, white, blue, and yellow as the colors for the individual planes. Modrian always began with a white canvas, but he did not leave the white planes of his paintings untouched, but rather painted with a white paint instead of leaving the original canvas exposed. The cracks in the paint within the white planes can be seen clearly. Um, so I guess you, this is one of those works that you probably do need to be in front of um, to appreciate. Each plane varies in size. The red plane is nearly nine times larger than the blue plane, which is subsequently about nine times as large as the yellow plane. Um, the four individual white planes vary in size as well. However, none of the aforementioned planes overlap. Instead, each plane lays adjacent to one another, and that means next to one another. This piece is an in, um, indicative representation of the work that was that um, that was created by Modrian um, during the decline of um, the the um, De Gestil movement. So the most distinctive figure in the composition with red, blue, and yellow is the largest red square located in the top right corner. This particular um, square takes up over half of the canvas. This piece also has a very distinctive thin, I'm sorry, distinctive thick and pronounced line separating a large white plane in the upper left corner into two individual planes. These two elements draw the viewer's eye inward and then force the eye to proceed in a downward manner that allowed the viewer to experience the painting first as individual elements, then as a whole. This is one of the most basic tenets of De Gestil. For the single element perceived as separate and the configuration of elements perceived as a whole. As mentioned previously, his um, palette consisted of extremely hard primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, as well as um, mixing neutrals, black, and white. The use of these bright, distinctive hues, um, yet never, nevertheless basic colors in such a dramatic and dynamic nature, emphasized um, one of the cornerstones of the De Gestel ideology in reference to returning to this state of simplicity. Modrian praised the use of primary colors and neutrals. This idea of simplicity of form also echoed throughout the white plains. These are not, this is not a neutral background, but a living, vibrant component of the painting. In some areas, the white is as much um, as, you know, related to form as the colored shapes um, of the lines. So the the composition is very repetitious by using the same basic shapes and colors. However, Modrian would not have perceived his work as repetitive, but instead would have seen this piece as a whole experienced made up of individual parts that generate a statement on the relationships between the individual and the collective or universal. The use of horizontal and vertical lines or elements is prevalent in this piece. The horizontal lines signify a sense of rest and repose, while the vertical lines communicate a sense of height to the piece. Working together as an overall piece, the lines together create a sense of stability um, and solidarity. In particular, Modrian's use of 90 degree angles throughout his composition evoke a sense of structural stability that reflects the ideas of permanence and reliability. Modrian was attempting to portray this sense of stability through his painting and evoke sentiments of a utopian society rather than face the instability of the world in its current state. Since asymmetry was praised in this style, Modrian uses juxtapositions, proportions, and location to create an overall harmony in his painting without um, definitively balancing the elements. So aesthetically speaking, Modrian used the idea of opposition in his painting to achieve this quality. So I know when you look at something like this, you think it's pretty simple and basic. And, you know, it's, it's you know, abstract art is, um, you know, pretty conceptual. And, and while it might appear 
you know, simplistic. Um, these artists really did have these kind of huge, very complex ideas of associated, um, in particular with these, you know, this arrangement of formal elements um, that I think they believed that viewers responded to in a, a psychological way. All right, so that concludes um, our um, exploration of Picasso and Cubism and responses to Cubism. So be sure to make sure that you do watch any of the Khan Academy, Academy videos that I've uploaded to you related to any of these works in your resource folder. And um, anyway, stay tuned for our next video.